In this tutorial, we're going to look at energy transfer and reactions. The first aim is explain what happens during a chemical reaction, then explain the difference between exothermic and endothermic reactions, and finally explain how to practically measure energy change in reactions. So I'm going to start off by showing you footage of the famous thermite reaction. This is a displacement reaction using iron oxide and aluminium. So let's have a watch. So there's aluminium, iron oxide, which looks reddish. We use a magnesium wick. We set fire to it, and then you stand well back. So it may not look like much, but what's so impressive about that reaction is the temperature rise during that reaction approaches something near the sun's surface temperature. That is incredibly hot. In fact, it's over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But why is it that some reactions are incredibly hot and release a lot of heat, and others don't? And why do some reactions actually take in heat rather than release it? This is what we're going to explore in this tutorial. To understand what happens in chemical reactions, it really helps by using this graph. This graph on the x-axis, we have time and we have energy on the y-axis. So let's say I'm starting off with these two chemicals, hydrogen and chlorine, and I want them to react to form hydrogen chloride, two molecules of hydrogen chloride. Now, as they are at this level of energy, they're not going to react. You see, for them to react, I need to break the bonds that hold them together so they can form new bonds between each other. But to break the bonds, I need to give them more energy. So basically, I need to increase the energy up to about this point here. So the point is, I need this much energy to break the bonds, the distance from here to here. That's how much energy I put in to break the bonds. Breaking bonds is an endothermic reaction. Endo means it takes in energy. So energy is needed or taken in by these molecules for the bonds to break. So the amount of energy needed for the bonds to break and for those atoms to separate is called the activation energy quite simply because it's the amount of energy you need to activate the reaction. So as you can see, this is how much activation energy we needed from here to here, or rather here to here. After the atoms separate, they will basically combine in new ways and form new bonds. So we can see that the hydrogen will bond to the chlorine, and so will this one. So we now have two new molecules made, the products. So we started off with the reactants, hydrogen chlorine, and we've ended up with two new molecules. These are the products. For the products to be made, new bonds between these atoms had to form. When new bonds form, energy is released. This is an exothermic process because energy is being released. So just to recap, energy is needed to break the bonds in the reactants and energy is released when bonds form to make the products. So every chemical reaction has an endothermic section and an exothermic part. But overall, a reaction can be regarded as exothermic or endothermic. You see, if a reaction requires less heat to break the bonds than it releases when bonds form to make the products, then it's exothermic because it releases more heat than it requires. These reactions feel hot and cause a temperature rise. You can remember the word exothermic by thinking of exit because heat, a lot of heat, exits this system. However, by contrast, some reactions require a lot of energy to get them going to break those bonds in the reactants, but release less energy when they form the products. These are called endothermic reactions, and they feel cold and bring about a drop in temperature. Think of endo for enter, because we need more energy input into the system. So that's how you explain what happens during a chemical reaction. So now let's truly try and define what an exothermic and endothermic reaction is. So exothermic reactions can be recognized from the graph they produce. In exothermic reactions, the reactants always start off with more energy than the products end up with. So the reactants have this much energy and products have much lower levels of energy. So remember, at this point, energy is needed to break the bonds. And then at this point, when new bonds form, energy is released. In other words, this arrow represents how much energy is excessed and leaves the system and we detect as heat. 
You see, if the product line was here with this level of energy, the same as reactants, we would feel no heat. The reaction wouldn't feel cold or hot. And that's because as much heat is put into the system as is leaving. But in exothermic reactions, far more leaves than is required to start the chemical reaction. This represents the difference. In endothermic reactions, notice the difference. Reactants start off with less energy than the products. In other words, we need this much energy to break the bonds in the reactants, and only this quantity of energy is released when the bonds form. As you can see clearly here, more energy is needed to start the reaction than is given out by the reaction. This helps us understand why endothermic reactions feel cold. You see, this reaction will not sustain itself. It needs more energy, so it will take in energy from the environment to make up for the energy it requires. So if you were to put your hand around a beaker which contained an endothermic reaction, your hands would feel very cold as the reaction draws heat away from your hands. And that's what cold is, the sensation of losing heat. Exothermic reactions, by contrast, because they release so much excess energy, they don't require more energy from the environment. The energy produced by the reaction is enough to sustain further reactions. So in endothermic graphs, the difference between the reactant energy level and the product energy level represents the extra amount of energy you need to put in to continue the reaction. In other words, that's how much energy you need to put in but this much energy is released, so that can be fed back into the reaction, meaning you need to supply that amount to make up the total amount. Exams may ask you to explain exothermic or endothermic reactions in terms of energy and bonds, and this can throw many students. It's normally for about three marks. Try to avoid sentences like exothermic reactions give out heat, because technically all reactions give out heat. It's just some give out less heat than they require, and some give out more heat than they require. So the best definition is an exothermic reaction is one where the heat released in forming bonds, so in other words this part of the graph, the amount of heat that's released when bonds form in the products is greater than the energy needed to break the bonds and the reactants. So the amount of heat released to form the bonds between the products is greater than the amount of energy needed to break the bonds and the reactants. Now this is a loaded sentence, there's no doubt about it. It's not an easy one to remember, but there is something reassuring about it. If you have to compare it to endothermic reactions, you can write exactly the same sentence, but you replace greater with less. Because then it reads, an endothermic reaction is one where the heat released in forming bonds in the product, so this side, is less than the energy needed to break the bonds in the reactants. So although you need to remember a loaded sentence, it's really just one word difference between exothermic and endothermic. It's worth committing this sentence to memory because it will or could give you three marks. So some exothermic reactions are kind of uh, slow. They don't release a lot of energy, but they're still exothermic. Like rusting is a slow exothermic reaction. It doesn't release a lot of heat. You don't gather around rusted nails to warm yourself up on a cold night, but it does release some heat. So it has to be regarded as exothermic overall. But some reactions, like combustion or explosion, they release a lot more heat, and they normally form the best science demo. For example, I'm sure you know the methane bubbles one. But these two are great as well. So exothermic reactions are pretty popular amongst students for obvious reasons. But endothermic reactions can be pretty amazing as well. Some very important endothermic reactions which you need to know for the exam are photosynthesis. That requires more heat than it gives out and dissolving ammonium nitrate in water. This is my favourite endothermic reaction of all time. Well, one you could do in a lab anyway. It starts off by placing some water on a wooden board. Watch what happens. They're like white powders. You can see it's powdery, and you can see this one is also powdery. Okay? It looks like fake snow. It smells funny. Notice the temperature. What does it say on the thermometer? It says 21.1. Read it again carefully. 22. No, read it again. What's before the C. two? What's before the two? Minus 24. Minus 24. 
frozen the water underneath. Ooh. So this reaction gets so cold that it actually freezes the water and allows me to pick up the wooden block that's now frozen to the beaker. So that is how you explain the difference between exothermic and endothermic reactions. Finally, you need to know how to measure energy changes accurately in various exothermic and endothermic reactions. Here are four reactions you need to know which would be associated with the temperature change. Dissolving salts in water, neutralization reactions, acids and alkalis, displacement reactions where more reactive element basically displaces a less reactive one from its compound, and precipitate reactions when a solid forms within a solution. Basically the problem is if something is changing temperature, heat can easily be lost to the environment and therefore will not be picked up by the thermometers, so it will affect the accuracy of your reading. What you need to do when doing such experiments is make sure as much of the heat is retained within the reacting chamber so the thermometer picks it all up. So the key word here is insulation. You want to take as many measures as possible to insulate this reaction really thoroughly. Here's what you do. Make sure you use a polystyrene cup in which the reaction will occur. Make sure you use cotton wool to further insulate the reaction and also cover it with a lid because most of the heat will escape out the top. If you do that, you'll get an accurate temperature reading or relatively much more accurate temperature reading. And that is how to practically measure energy changes in reactions.